Kennedy Egan. Some of you might know, some of you might not. Um, I used to be involved in sport for many, many years. Um, I'm retired a long time now, so I'm probably just a distant memory in some people's heads out in the crowd. But uh, I used to do a bit of boxing. Uh, I represented the country, travelled around the world ten times over, lived out of a suitcase, and people thought that was amazing. Um, but I had those 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day, every day, relentless, telling me that I wasn't good enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not fit enough, I'm a failure, I'm a waster, I'm a loser. Nothing good is ever going to come about me. And that was my pattern for a long, long, long time. But I had a dream. I wanted to be an Olympian. Have we any aspiring Olympians in the crowd? Now that worries me. That really worries me. I, I, I was at a talk a number of weeks ago and I asked the same question and no hands were raised. What is going on in this country that we don't have an appetite to be Olympians? Yes, it is hard. It's a long, it's a hard, grueling struggle. They say it takes 10,000 hours to become an Olympian. I don't agree with that. It takes much, much more. Um, and I'm going to talk about my journey to become an Olympian in more detail, but the sacrifices that are required, I can see why no hand has been raised here today. Um, because it's the horrible, horrible, horrible existence that only a small few people get to, to experience. But that was my dream, to be that Olympian. At eight years of age, I watched Michael Crute win his gold medal back in 1992. And my eldest brother was part of a boxing club and he brought me to the club and I had an instant appetite for boxing. And you're probably thinking, why would you want to get into a ring and punch someone else in the face? And I still ask myself that same question. Even recently when I retired, you know, to be in a dressing room 10, 15 minutes before a fight, even Olympic final, and you're asking this same, yourself the same question, why am I doing this? I must be mad going out here to step in a ring to hit someone. Um, and that's a scary feeling, but it just makes me feel alive. It made me feel alive, it made me f switch on, it made me get ready for battle. And the first crack I had in Olympics was 2004 in Athens, where I tried to qualify for the Games, but I failed. I had three opportunities and I failed three of them. And I came back to the country with no medal in stow, and again, I'm not good enough, I'm going to retire, I'm not strong enough, I'm not fit enough, boxing's not for me, I'm never, never going to become that Olympian. And all I wanted was those five rings on my tracksuit top. That's all I wanted. I wanted to be the Olympian. Deep down, I could tell myself I was good enough, but I couldn't act it out because, again, I was suffocated by all these negative thoughts. I was going to training camps. I was performing very, very well in training camps, proving to myself that I was good enough. But when the time came to step into the ring, I'd fall apart. And that was the same pattern. And I couldn't figure out why I was failing at the, at the, at the very end. Um, so, tried to qualify for Olympic Games was like my Mount Everest. And I put all my eggs in the one basket because I wanted to be that Olympian so bad. So I dedicated my whole life, my whole being to become an Olympian. Sacrificed everything. Friends, holidays, weekends away with the lads, all that type of stuff. Just to become that Olympian. Spending all my time in the gym, winning Irish titles, representing Ireland all over the world, coming back and trying to qualify. And it's all I wanted to be was the Olympian. When I qualified there, I, this was my sixth attempt. So I had three attempts in 2004, three attempts in 2008. And when I beat the German to qualify, I had to reach the semi-final, I beat the German. I dropped to my knees when I got the result. And that's where I won my Olympic medal in Beijing. I won it in Athens. I just went to Beijing to collect it. Because if you can imagine the pressure and the stress and the turmoil I went through to become that Olympian. That was the hardest part. The monkey was off my back. When I finally qualified, the pressure was off. I had become what I wanted to be all my life, the Olympian. Now, like I said earlier my, at the start of this talk, I neglected everything else. Studies, schooling, a plan B. I had no plan B for after the games. So when I qualified, Went to the Games, the most amazing Olympic Games ever. In Beijing, the Olympic Village full of all the superstars, sit, having lunch with Roger Federer, Rafa Nadal sitting beside you, and it's, I'm part of this group. 10,500 athletes 
in the same place every four years to do the best they can and try and perform and win medals. And I'm part of that. I'm there. I booked my seat. I earned my spot. And the Olympic Games itself is not really important. I'm, and I'm playing that down like, like, you know, I'm very modest, but I went out there to perform and to enjoy myself, as we did the five boxers that were on that team. There was only five qualified from boxing for Ireland. Three, out, out of our five lads, three of us won medals. The Olympic team that year consisted of 51 athletes. No one else won a medal. So we were the superstars coming back to Dublin. But we went out there, we performed, we were a smile on our faces and we enjoyed it. Now I'm not here to talk about the Olympic Games and my Olympic success. The important thing here is what happens after. Like I said, no planning, no, no structure in place for when I come back from the Games. And you look at this picture here. The Olympics is behind me now. I win the medal. Everything is fantastic. We're blocked off from the world in this Olympic village. We don't know what's going on at home. The interest, the media, the, 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 you know, the, the scale of this achievement, I was oblivious to because we were blocked away. No, no internet, no media. So I get off the plane. And when those Olympic Games were over, reality hit me. I put all my eggs in the one basket. I'd sacrificed everything in my being to become the Olympian. And when that Games was over, I didn't know what to do. That was the peak of my Mount Everest. I had scaled the heights. I had represented my country at Olympic Games. I came back with a silver medal. But that was it. What do I do now? And that was very, very scary for me. Coming back to this small country with the, with the success of the medal, the media interest, the fame, everyone wants to be famous. But let me tell you, fame is not what it's all cracked up to be. There was a massive intrusion into my personal life, and I found it very, very hard to fathom. And for me, my mental resilience was tested. Now, when I come back from the games, I drank, and I drank very, very hard, because I didn't want to deal with what was bestowed upon me, this success, this fame, this interest. And when I come back, there was no structure put in place for us to return to training or any of this type of stuff, and I was let off the rails. And it took me 18 years to get to, you know, to, get to my, my peak, 18 years of training. When I first laced my first pair of gloves, 18 long years of highs and lows, winning, losing, success, failure, and more times failure than, than success. I've walked to that airport 10 times over with no medals, and nobody there to greet us, to say, well done. Not one person, not one journalist, not one reporter. A bunch of failures. And I was the failure. Coming home every competition with no medal, or a bronze medal, or no medal again, or a bronze medal. Failing, failing, failing. But so fast forward a few years, from the peak of my Everest to rock bottom, took two years to achieve. And when I say rock bottom, my family didn't want to talk to me, my brothers had disowned me, I had been a horrible, horrible person for two years because of my alcohol consumption, my misuse and abuse of alcohol. I was in a dark, horrible place, not wanting to face responsibilities, not wanting to make decisions about my future because I was stuck in a bubble for so long. Now, don't get me wrong, sport is fantastic and it's very positive for people to get involved in sport. But for me, allowing myself to get consumed into a sport that I loved and, and get sucked into it and have no other outlet had a massive effect on my health and well-being when I come back from the Games because I didn't have that plan B. And if I'm not the Olympian, then who am I? That loss of identity was frightening for me. But for me, I had to take ownership of my own wrongdoing, put my hands up and accept the actions that I had bestowed on people and make amends and say sorry and apologise. That's what I needed to do and take ownership of the problem that I had. That I, was, I was an alcoholic and I was drinking too much and my life had become unmanageable. So if we're coming walking off that plane, a superhero, coming into that airport full to the brim with people to wish you well and shake your hand and touch the medal, two weeks later, I'm standing outside a pub getting sick all over a car park at half two in the day. The same kids that had seen me coming in the open top bus are watching me do the same thing, getting sick on a, on a car park floor. That is not right. That is not normal. My biggest challenge and my big, biggest success in the sporting context was the Olympic medal. But my biggest success in life is becoming sober. And I became sober on the 12th of August 2010. 
and I'm eight years sober since. But what does that require? It requires a new mindset. And it does require mental resilience and making decisions and associating yourself with the right people. I had a thousand friends when I came back from Beijing. Everybody wanted to be me pal, shaking my hand, patting me on the back, telling me I was a great guy. And I got sucked into that. That consumed me and I believed it. But really, I was a coward. Not turning up to events, letting people down. I was a compulsive liar. All these horrible things that I turned out to be. And I, I needed to address that. Assume we need to try and stay positive. Half the glass full. And that's how I operate. I get, get out of bed in the morning, put me two feet in the ground, and I tell myself I'm a good person. Because I'm going to start today on a good note. Sometimes I get out of bed and I bang me, you know, I get out of bed and I bang me toe off the corner of the, of the table. I course the table. But then I just reset. I tell myself I'm a good person. And off I go and I get on with my day. I don't go out and tend to do any harm on anyone. What has taught me over the last number of years, have I gone back to college and becoming a psychotherapist and, you know, it's been authentic. And that word gets thrown around an awful lot. But for me, I am what you see up here. Okay, I'm an Olympic silver medalist. Fantastic. And maybe when I'm 70 years of age, I look back and look in that little box in the corner of the sitting room and open it up every now and again and say, yeah, that was an amazing achievement. But that Olympic medal doesn't define who I am. That Olympic medal was an achievement in August 2008 when I boxed out of my skin for two weeks. It's not about medals. It's not about success in, in sport. Sport, like I said, sport is fantastic. But I'm going to be on this planet an awful lot longer than, you know, than Beijing 2008. So the message today is, is when you're sitting with people, your friends, your family, we need to listen more. That's why we have two ears and one mouth. We do too much talking or we do too less talking when we're on our phones. But if someone's sharing a story with you or wants to have a chat with you, you have to start listening and actively listen. Make the effort to listen to the tone of the voice. See if there's a problem there. And if they feel that you are listening to them, they'll probably open up a bit more. We're in this world now of social media where nobody talks to each other. The Snapchats, the Facebooks, it's just, it's gone crazy. But we need to start coming back to ourselves, switching on, taking ownership of our own actions and becoming whole again and communicating on a ground level basis, eye to eye, verbal, vocally, instead of on phones and on Snapchat and on Facebook. I'm going to finish with this. There's a man on a golf course on his own. He's on a par three. He gets the golf club, gives the ball a smack as hard as he can, goes up into the sky, he's watching the ball, he's watching it, he's watching it, he's watching it, it lands on the green, it starts rolling down towards the flag, and he's watching it, and he's watching it, he's waiting for it, waiting for it to see what happens, it falls into the hole, and he jumps around like this, he wants to celebrate, but there's no one there to celebrate with, the hole in one means nothing to him, that's the importance of connection, we're, we're social beings, we need to interact with each other. But let's try and interact on a positive level. Thank you.